quería hablar en español, pero mi español es muy primitivo. So I'm just going to speak in English. Uh, my name is Ian Almond. Uh, I teach uh, world literature at Georgetown University in Qatar. And this is, uh, I'm, I'm English, I'm British. This is Dr. Adil Aslan. She teaches um, also literature at Georgetown University in Qatar, she's from Turkey. Um, we're going to do two interrelated things today, but they are sort of slightly different, but they're following one another, okay? Um, and obviously I'm speaking in English, but if there's something you don't understand, please ask me again, it's absolutely no problem, okay? Now I'm going to speak for exactly 20 minutes, okay? This doesn't happen in real life, but it does happen in the classroom, okay? So. Uh, I'm very, just very quickly and basically then I'm talking about this, unfortunately this, um, what you're going to hear is pure useless literature. It cannot help you within the realm of neoliberal capitalism whatsoever, okay? <laughs> just making that clear from the word go, right? Um, but we're talking about comparative orientalisms in Mexican, Turkish and Bengali literature. I don't have time to ask why, but if you want to ask later why Mexico, Turkey, Bengal, I'm happy to go into the details. Basically, it's trying to decenter notions of world literature, which are overwhelmingly Euro-American in nature, by using, if you like, peripheral non-Western countries. And Mexico, Turkey, and Bengal. Bengal now, obviously, half of it is India, West Bengal. Half of it is today Bangladesh. These are three regions that I'm looking at, OK? And we're talking about Orientalism. So Orientalisms, as some of you probably know, are sort of concepts of the Islamic Orient and Islam, sort of often idealized, often either demonized, cliched landscapes, if you like. And it's a reference also, perhaps some of you know, to Edward Said's book on Orientalism. So um, I'm gonna, um, first of all, the most obvious thing to say is that if we're talking about images of Islam and Islam, why is Turkey there? Because Turkey is, of those three countries, Turkey is a Muslim country. But here, even though we're talking about outsiders' concepts of Islam, we're really talking about non-believers' attitudes towards Islam and Islam, the Islamic Orient. And of course, within Turkish literature, you also have atheists, agnostics, and two of the writers that we're talking about, Orhan Pamuk and Oaz Atay, were both, at the very best, nominal, um, I would say the very best agnostics, you could perhaps even say atheists, and there's a whole set of other, there's the communist poet Nazim Hikmet, there, there's so many sort of writers that were following this, so it does count in a way as an outsider's attitude towards the Orient. Um, and um, the first thing also I would say is that normally when we talk about Orientalism, we talk about so-called Western images of Islam, yeah? So we talk about images of Islam or the Orient in the US and in Europe, in Spain, in France, in Germany and so on. Um, but please don't have any doubt about it, these regions are all ca equally capable of delivering, if you like, familiar pastiche versions of the Orient. I could read you a passage from a Bengali poet, Rabindranath Tagore, which is full of um, sort of mosques and camels and the bulbul, the nightingale and all of these very sort of classic and you could even say cliched images of an Islamic Orient. And we run, in some cases we do immediately run up against a problem because in Bengali 19th century literature there is definitely an influence from English, for example, 19th century Victorian poetry that is definitely there. But at the same time, in a weird kind of echo chamber, Bengalis were also familiar with genuine Urdu language, local source Persian ghazals. So, do you know what I mean? You have a kind of repetition within. Yes, when they talk about the Orient, or when they talk about the Moor, there is definitely an influence from this Western Orientalism, but there is also an immediate response of Bengali Hindu poets towards their Muslim Bengali neighbors. So it gets very, very complicated in other words. Um, and I'm, I'm basically, I'm, I'll sum up the text, I've got a feeling I'm going to end the talk before I get to the end, so I'll sum it up sort of basically by saying that um, I'm not going to ask the, I, fairly, I think, fairly obvious question, and not so subtle question, which is basically, to what extent does Mexican, Bengali, Turkish versions of the Orient 
uh, resemble this kind of like classic American and European. But I'm not. We can talk about that, but I think that's a fairly obvious question. What I'm more interested in is what I'm going to argue is that there's something about in each of these writers, in each of these sets of writers, whether it's Octavio Paz, whether it's Robinson Tagore, um, whether it's Orhan Pamuk, when questions of a false national consciousness arise, a historical memory of Islam is invoked. So whenever they try to interrogate their own national identity and the possible falsity, the possible mendacity of their own internalized nationalist narrative, some kind of historical memory of Islam and of the violence of Islamic conquest is a factor in there. And that's, that's really sort of like what I'm sort of trying to sort of gravitate towards today. Um, so, uh, when I talk about Bengali Orientalism, um, first of all, before I even start talking about Bengalis uh, and what they t how they talk about the Orient, the place of Islam within North India, you need to have just a very basic sense of that. So if you've got the image in your head, because I forgot to put this on the screen, but basically, map of India, if you like, the map of South Asia, um, if you go, the northern band of South Asia was a band of the subcontinent which was more or less occupied, colonized by the Mughal Muslim empires some point between the 1200 and 1400, okay? What's the most famous image of India? What's, the, what's like the, the most famous monument in India? Thank you. Where, what religion does the Taj Mahal come from? What religion is that? Is it the Hindu temple? What is it? Right, it's a Muslim mausoleum, okay? Um, and you've got lots and lots of... So basically, um, you have sort of... Between the... For about three centuries, four centuries, large parts of India, and I'm including Bengal here, were occupied by a Persian or Arabic language and a Muslim Indo-Islamic presence. And this is what we call the, the fruits of Indo-Islamic culture. Positive or negative, there was a lot of violence, there was a lot of beautiful buildings and ghazals, I'm not going to get into that conversation, but um, definitely that is uh, an aspect of it. And it's crucial because it is a central component in the formation of modern Indian identity. Okay? Um, now, if you keep that in mind, uh, we'll get on to the first text, which is Nirad Chaudhuri. So, when Nirad Chaudhuri, he's a, he's a mid 20th century Bengali writer, writing in English, and when he writes about Indian nationalism, one of the things he says is even the maniacal. Uh, even the maniacal hatred of the Muslim, which is sweeping over Hindu India today, has not emancipated the Hindu from his Islamic ways. The fierce menads from the divided Punjab, who even in buses mutter imprecations, curses against Muslims, have no idea of the true character of their shalwar and Kurta. Um, so, basically, if I can just explain who Chaudhuri is mocking here, he's mocking modern Indian nationalists. Because if you see them today, and even today, sorry if there's any, I hope there's no Indian people in the room, any Hindu nationalists in the room, but if you see them, a lot of their argument is based against Islam, against Pakistan. They're walking around with kurtas, yeah? They're walking around with a uniform, which basically is Islamic. The, the, the standard, the, the, when you see them with their kurtas, these are like length dresses that go to the knee. And most of the modern Indian nationalists have these, these manners. And they are, they are Islamic in nature. They come from the Mughal period. So Chaudhuri is mocking this. He's saying, you know, these people go Hindu for Hamar, Hindustan, our Hindu land. But they don't get it that they're walking around in Muslim clothes. So there's already, in many ways, for people like Chaudhuri, Islam is the dark, dirty secret of Indian nationalism. There's a false consciousness at the heart of that. Now, Chaudhuri is criticizing people, but um, we see another passage, and this is um, it's from a very, very famous Bengali poet um, called Rabindranath Tagore, one of the first Indians to win the Nobel Prize in 1918, um, and in many ways, um, a very sort of spiritual figure, an incredibly, almost like an Oedipal figure for Bengali literature. 
But God and poets really had a love-hate relationship to Tagore because he was so influential. And he's got this interesting passage here. Countries that are fortunate find the essence of their land, you can all see that there, find the essence of their land in the history of their country. The reading of history produces their people, introduces their people to their country with it from infancy. With us, the opposite is the case, with us Bengalis. It is the history of our country that hides the essence of this land from us. Whatever historical records exist from Mahmud's invasion, that's a Muslim emperor, to the arrogant imperial pronouncements of Lord Curzon, that's the British, these constitute a strange mirage for India. The trumpeting of elephants, the golden glow of silk curtains, the stone bubbles of mosques, the mysterious silence of the palaces guarded by eunuchs, all these produce a huge magical illusion with their amazing sounds and colours. But why should we call this Islamic history India's history? It has covered the Panti, Panti's verses, it has covered the Panti's of India's holy, holy mantras by a fascinating Arabian Nights tale. So, for Tagore, Tagore is lamenting the fact that in Bengal today, we don't know our own history anymore. All of the language, the uniform, the, the, the culture that we have is largely coming from this Muslim period. And it's almost as if there's an essence within us, says Tagore, which is masked by this exterior. And it's a strangely sectarian moment in Tagore. Otherwise, Tagore was a genuinely spiritual and an anti, not just a non, but an anti-sectarian person. But there's this moment here which almost suggests that there's an essence which is being, there's like this collective false consciousness. And so in a way, in a, in a less acerbic way, he's making the same point as Chaldura. Um, and in many ways, it's almost like nationalist misrecognition is this refusal to acknowledge the violence of the Islamic period, yeah? It's this refusal to acknowledge the externalities of the, the true provenance of these external, um, these, uh, and, and one, of, uh, one of the most Orientalist texts, I think, in modern Bengali literature is a story by Rabindranath Tagore, which I'm not going to go into because we're out of time, called Hungry Stones, the Kushudita Pasha, where basically, uh, it's a ghost story about a, a palace, which in the daytime is just an abandoned palace, but at night takes on almost like this magical air of an, of an oriental harem. Um, but in the modern, it's a genuine exoticizing orientalist tale. Um, but this really uh, brings me a little bit closer linguistically and culturally to our students in the room, because when we get to Mexico, what I'd like to argue is that there's a similar historiographical use of Islam in undermining and interrogating an identity. Um, so, uh, for, to begin with, in Mexican literature, there's a whole set of writers who play with mostly things like the Arabian Nights, the Thousand Moon Nights, Alibaba and the Folly Thieves, and so on and so forth. Um, so there's Jose, Jose Amigo Pacheco, who talks about Arabs and Arab characters. Um, there's Rosa Beltran, who has a very interesting uh, erotic short story called Sheik Rezada, Pumming on Sheik Rezada. Um, there are all kinds of like um, uses in modern Mexican literature of this. Um, and this really comes, this, this interest in the Arab world comes from two things, right? First of all, in a slightly more conventional way, as some of you perhaps know, there is an Arab population in Latin America. As, as perhaps some of you know, yeah? The largest country which has this is Argentina. There's about 20 million Argentinians of... Out of 20 million Argentinians, there are 2.2 million Argentinians of Arab origin, okay? Including the most famous, the Argentinian president, Carlos Manuel. Um, these were mostly from the 19th century. They were mostly Christian Ottomans who were fleeing persecution. But there was an increasing number as well of um, Muslims, mostly from the Syro, Lebanese region, and then of course after 47 and the Nakba, when the Palestinians were thrown off their land, there were also Palestinians coming. So, and in Mexico, I would say there's about half a million Mexicans of Lebanese origin, okay? so which, is, which, it's a tiny fraction, but it is a significant, and there's many famous writers who come from these Mexican, Henry Sabines and Gabriel Zaina, just two of these examples. So there's that demographic, but, and here is where we get closer to where you people are, um, 
I think a more interesting component here is the fact that the, the Luso-Hispanic culture in 1492, which colonized the so-called Nuevo Mundo, was one in which an Islamic legacy was a very, very strong component. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, and if you want to, you can get it, maybe some of the conversation. I know this is there, but the Arab, the, the, the fact that the, the country that initiated the Reconquista, not just the fact that the same year the Nuevo Mundo was discovered, we got rid of the last Moroccan, right? The last king of Granada. Not just a symbolic linking, but in very much so culturally, you had a culture which was fresh from 700 years of the occupation of Islam. Again, I don't want to get into it with you think that's positive or negative, or I'm not interested, but it's the anthropological fact. And this is not lost on Mexican writers who are interrogating their, their own identity. Alberto Ruiz Sanchez is a Mexican writer who, I'm, I mean, I've only read two or three of his stories. The covers don't look promising because they're usually sort of like half-naked women. Maybe, should we blame him? Should we blame his publisher? I don't know. Um, but Alberto Ruiz Sanchez is someone who um, returns to, he actually goes to a place called in, in Morocco called Mogador. And it's interesting what he says here, I put this. My first trip to Mogador became a much, this is in, in Morocco, okay? This is a Mexican writer which, um, going, going visiting a town on the Moroccan coast. My first trip to Mogador became a much longer and deeper journey. First came the shock of discovering a place that, in spite of being so distant from Mexico, provoked a strong impression of recognition, much greater than the one a Mexican receives upon re arriving to Spain. A combination of body language, place, and objects made me feel that I had ventured into another Mexico. Our legacy, our Mexican legacy, derives from five centuries of mixing Indian and Spanish blood. But we must not overlook the Arab heritage running through our veins, introduced by Spaniards' bodies. We must not forget that for eight centuries, two-thirds of what is now Spain and Portugal was Arabic, the Andalusi civilization. Um, so Sanchez, first of all, the identity crisis here is personal, okay? It's micro, not macro. Sanchez is speaking very personally, very empirically, very experientially of his own feelings on, on coming, visiting this, this otherwise alien environment, yes, a Moroccan town. Um, and there's an almost um, atavistic sense here. There's almost there's something like an ancestral return which is at work here, which I find interesting in itself. And it brings in questions of race even, when we consider um, the way that is. But I, I think also equally important here is this notion of return. So he's not venturing out, as many Westerners would say, if they were visiting the, the so-called Muslim world. He feels he's returning to the Muslim world. He feels he's returning to a place which belongs to him and to which he belongs. And this sense of an ante anterior precedence, I think it says a great deal about Mexican Orientalism and the way Mexican Orientalism, unlike American Orientalism or European, is fractured and refracted in a very different way. And, it's, and, it's, and it, that refraction takes place through a problematizing of the easy history of the conquest of the new world. Um, we could go to another Mexican writer here, Carlos Fuentes, quite a famous Amer uh, Mexican writer here. And he has a passage here in one of his essays called In Esto Creo, where he says, and then I'll briefly sum it up, um, quizás hacía fa this, this is a light entertainment section where you can listen to my Spanish. But. Quizás hacía falta esta asimilación indo afro iberoamericana para atender el cuento, el puente sobre el Atlántico, colmar el abismo de los rencores, de las carreras y reconocernos en nuestra otra mitad que es España. Pero España para Iberoamérica es algo más que España. Es el Mediterráneo renaciendo en el Caribe, el Golfo, el Pacífico y el, el Atlántico americanos. España es la filosofía griega y el derecho romano. España es la España de las tres culturas, cristiana, árabe y judía, dándose cita en la corte de Alfonso el Sabio, y desastrosamente expulsada por el dogmatismo ciego de los reyes católicos Isabel y Fernando. 
And I guess like the main, for people who don't know Spanish, the main thing I'm emphasizing here um, is that basically Fuentes is emphasizing the three religions of this Spain, yeah? Not one, not even two, but three religions. And I think it's, there's a couple of things going on here. Um, first of all, this memory of Islam here, this remembering Islam in this rewriting of the history of the of the new world um, is a counter-European gesture, okay? So we're not talking about Europeans arriving in the Nuevo Mundo. He is deliberately including Muslims in this. He's deliberately including the non-European in this. Um, so in other words, it's, uh, it's not just a de-Europeanizing gesture, it's also a de-Christianizing gesture here. He is de-Christianizing this moment of the, of the so-called discovery. Again, and, and I think what it shows here is how this attempt to find Islam in Europe, which is what Fuentes is doing here, yeah, provocatively, he's problematizing the notion of Spain. He's problematizing this, this pat notion of Isabel and Fernando. Um, it parallels in many ways certain Mexican writers' attempt to find the mestizo in Mexico, okay? There's a parallel project there. In both, and it's a parallel, I wouldn't say anti-Christian in any negative sense, but it is a, a project which is trying to restore an originary sense of multiplicity to what has been presented and papered over as a Christian project, a, a Christian trajectory. So I think this, this, this proximity of the two are, are very interesting. Um, but I'm, I'm really sort of like, I've got to 20, 20 minutes there, um, I'm going to sort of wind up with that. All I'm going to say is that um, what emerges in this, and this is my concluding point, I'm jumping back the Turkish section, but the, what is interesting is how in these Orientalisms, perhaps the, the, the single most interesting difference is that in Western Orientalisms, the Islamic world and the so-called West, the desperate want of a better term, are, is a clear, crystal clear dichotomy, you know, clash of civilization style. Yeah? There's a clear binary presented. But in these, three, um, in these three regions, what you find is that it's not so Manichaean. It's not such a dualistic. Level. On the contrary, Islam is seen, and it's not positive or negative, okay? I would emphasize this, it's not that it's been idealized or demonized, but Islam is seen as a major world system which is one of a number of factors inflecting and interacting. That for me is a, one of the useful things to bring out of these otherwise uh, orientalistic uh, narratives that we see in these three regions. Okay, I'm waiting right for that. I'll hand over to Dr. Aslan. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Thank you.